God we trust. The idea of trusting in God. And uh, we're drawing to the end of that now. Here over the next month we'll transition into our Advent season with uh, the Advent Conspiracy once again. We're going to be doing the Advent Conspiracy again as a church this year. So uh, you should, if you were here with us last year, that ought to be exciting to you to see what we can do. Uh, this last year we did so many things. I mean, as people began to realize what Christmas really means, and they began to realize how self-indulgent America is, and how we have, even us as Christians, we've kind of morphed that holiday into a chance to bless ourselves, and uh, so this church last year turned it around. We literally turned Christmas upside down, and we were a blessing to many. There were people who gave uh, to the shoebox ministry. There were people that gave to Angel Tree. There were people who gave to uh, uh, Compassion and Adopted Children. We even had one of our uh, groups in our one-way club that took on the responsibility for one of our Compassion Children. And then many of us donated to a project where we actually uh, gave money to have a freshwater well dug in Bolivia. And so there's a village in Bolivia that has a well for the very first time providing them fresh, clean water that we did. And the idea was to, instead of giving ourselves Christmas, to give Christmas away. And I can tell you that the folks that participated in that uh, the words that I heard back from people about how blessed they were through that process, it just verifies what Jesus said was true when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so we're going to be doing that again. And so now we're reaching the end of the sermon series, In God We Trust. And uh, there's no more appropriate way to end that than to get back to basics. Uh, we got some packer backers in the crowd this morning. Anybody? A few, right? Well, I remember many years ago when I, when I lived in Denver, and I'm a, I'm a Broncos fan, love the Packers, root for the Packers all the time. Uh, but I remember way back in Denver hearing a story about your old coach, Vince Lombardi, and how every preseason training camp, when the players would gather and they'd come into the, to Lambeau there to, to reset the team for the following season, the very first day of training camp, he would walk to the center of the team and he would hold up his hand with a football and he'd say, man, this is a football. And he would begin basic training with blocking and tackling. And Vince Lombardi always said that the team that wins is the team that blocks and tackles the best. In other words, those that get the basics down the best are the ones that win. And when I study football today, it's a finesse game, much more than it was any other time in my life, but still the teams that block and tackle are the ones that win. When you look at any sport, it's the teams that do the basic things the best that usually win. And I don't think that's any mistake. I think that's kind of the way we're built. And so we're going back to the basics this morning. We're going to look at Romans chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me there right now to Romans chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul, over the last nine chapters has laid down this uh, philosophy that, that uh, every one of us has sinned. No one is good enough to stand before God on his own right. None of us can stand before God and say to him, I'm good enough to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, in Romans 3.23, he says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. Every one of us has broken God's rules in one way or another, and therefore every one of us cannot stand in God's presence and say, I have a right to be here. And so Paul is laying out this treatise that the idea that you can be good enough to get into heaven is a false theology. And there needs to be something more than that. And to the Jewish mind in that day, they had the law, they had the prophets, but they didn't understand them. And they had this idea that the, the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and brought back down had to be the way that they could get that right standing with God. Not recognizing that throughout that time, from Genesis, thousands of years before they were born, Thousands of years before Father Abraham was born. 
God had set an example in which he had clearly demonstrated that only blood covers sin. Nothing else. And so Paul is going back to basics here in chapter 10. And he's talking to Gentiles. Paul is the, 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 the apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, God called him to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles because so many of the Israelites who had had the teachings of the Torah, the Old Testament, for, for millenniums had not done that. And so Paul's taking that message to the Gentiles. Those people who aren't Jews are Gentiles. So if you're not a Jew in this room this morning, then you're a Gentile. And Paul was our apostle in that respect. And so Paul begins by saying, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the, is for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Now that would have been an unusual thing to say in that time. Because the reality is everybody thought the Jews were all saved. They were God's chosen people. They were his little dumplings. And so certainly all of the Israelites would be saved. And for Paul to say something like that would have been astounding to those Jews in the audience and even more astounding to people who knew the legacy of the Jews. Well, wait a minute. Paul, earlier in chapter 6 and in chapter 8, you said salvation comes to us through the Jews. And now you're saying that it's your desire that they be saved. What's up with that? And so there, there's some, just some incredulity here in what, in what Paul is saying. He says, for I can testify about them that they're zealous for God. If there was anything that was true about the Jewish nation is that they were zealous for God. They were actively, passionately trying to do things to please God. It says, but their zeal was not based on knowledge. And there's our first clue that somebody got something wrong. What was their zeal based on? It was based on the desire to make myself righteous in God's eyes, which was the sin of Adam and Eve. As Satan, the serpent in the garden, tempted them, he used the words, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And they thought, wow, we can be righteous on our own apart from God. And that's been the problem throughout the ages. When I have witnessed to people, and, and despite my, my uh, enthusiasm sometimes, most of the people that I've witnessed to don't ever, or at least I'm not aware that they've ever surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Most of them don't get it. Most of them don't say, yes, Lord. And the reason is because they don't want to need a Savior. They don't want to have to acknowledge somewhere within them, and in most cases publicly, that they're incapable of earning eternal life based on their own behavior. And these Jews that Paul was referring to, they were no different. It says, for I can testify they were zealous about God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since why? Why wasn't it? Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. They didn't know that. How could they not know that? How could they not know that there was a righteousness that comes from God when they heard about Adam and how God slayed an animal and covered them? When they heard about Cain and how God put his mark on him and covered him? And throughout the time prior to Abraham, prior to all that other stuff where the nation of Israel was formed, God clearly demonstrated that righteousness does not come from what we do. And so it says in the second half of verse 3, it says, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And therein lies the problem. As we stand here this morning, and I, I were to hold up a, a football in a training camp and say, men, this is a football. I would stand up to you this morning as the beginning of Christianity, and I would say, people, submission is the begin." Uh, beginning of Christianity, submitting to God, submitting to God's righteousness. Now, righteousness is kind of a funny word. We attach a lot of spiritual significance to that. Very simply, it's right standing. Righteousness means right standing with God. And so what these Jews were doing is that they were seeking to establish their own right standing with God. And many of us today, are trying to do the same thing. We're trying to establish our own right standing with God. 
those of you in this room, and I know most of you, and I know that you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, as you go out into the world this afternoon and throughout the rest of this week and seek to live a life worthy of the calling that you have been given, you're going to discover that most of the people, if not all of the people that you come into contact with, fall into this camp. They're trying to establish a right standing with God based on their own abilities. And the stumbling block is they don't want to or can't acknowledge that they need a Savior. And Paul says his fellow countrymen, his, his biological crew, the people that he was genetically connected with, who had been given all of God's teachings, they were the mouthpiece of God in the world. They had gotten it wrong, and they had tried to seek to have a right standing with God that came from their own works. And there are even some people in this room this morning who honestly believe that the way God looks at them in love is through the filter of their behavior. Even though it says in Romans, this is how we know what love is in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They don't understand that God's love comes to us not because of anything we've done, not because we can even earn his favor, but because he just loves us. And so Paul was talking about his countrymen. And he's saying, man, they didn't know the righteousness that came from God because they were seeking to establish their own righteousness. It says Christ is the end of the law. I don't know how much clearly the writer of Romans could have put that. Christ is the end of the law. Everything that the law tried to do, Christ did. The law said, if you can obey this 100%, then you can be righteous in my eyes. But no one could. So the existence of the law was the testimony of failure. It provided proof that none of us is perfect. And it had to end. In order for us to get that right standing with God, the law had to end. And so we hear Paul saying, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness, there may be right, stand, right standing for everyone who follows the law, for everyone who gets circumcised, for everyone who gets baptized, for everyone, no, for everyone who believes. It requires us to believe. It requires us to believe that what God said is true. What does that belief look like? I read you the portion in Isaiah today for a very specific reason. It talks about what we're to believe. What we're to believe is that all of us have fallen short of God's mark. To believe in Jesus is to acknowledge I can never have right standing on my own. No matter how many rules I obey, no matter how many good deeds I do, no matter how many times I help my neighbor, no matter how many times I give to the offering plate, no matter how many scripture verses I memorize, no matter how many perfect attendance pins I win, nothing that I can do will ever give me right standing with God. That's the first part of the belief. When you say, I believe in Jesus, you affirm that you can never establish right standing on your own. And it's important for you to understand that because as you go out into this world, they don't, under, they don't know that. They're not, they don't have that wisdom. When they say, I believe in Jesus, they're saying, I believe historically he existed. That's not what it means to believe in Jesus. To believe in Jesus means to attribute everything said about him and everything that he said as being true. And what was said about him is that he died for our sins. And so Paul says, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be right standing for everyone who believes. Now, be, we go on and we look at before the, even the law was given, before the Ten Commandments was given, he, Paul talks about Moses before he went up on Mount Sinai. It says, Moses describes it this way. The righteousness that is by the law, the man who does these things will live by them. What, Paul, what Moses was saying there is, look, if you think that the law is what it's going to take to make you right in God's eyes, you better, you better obey every rule. You better not ever 
make a mistake. Because as soon as you make a mistake, you are no longer in the perfect camp. You're now in the imperfect camp and you now have a death penalty on your head. He goes on to say, Moses described that those who uh, uh, do the law will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith, Paul, uh, Moses said, but there is a righteousness that is by faith. And here's what it says. It says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. What that literally means is, do not say in your heart, look, I've been good. I can go to heaven. I've been good. You know, one of these days I'm going to stand before God and and he's going to look at all the bad things that I did, and he's going to look at all the good things that I did, and if the good things I did were I have a taller stack than the bad things, then he's going to say, come on into heaven. There are so many of us, believe me, I'll bet there are people in this room this morning that if you could just rip open their minds, you'd discover that's what they believe. They really believe that God will never send anybody to hell who's basically a good person. But what they don't understand is this, that God that they stand before, Someday everyone is going to stand before God. That God that they stand before is none other than Jesus Christ. He will be the judge sitting on the throne. Not God the Father. He's given that authority to his son. And so this man with holes in his hands and a spear hole in his side, is going to sit there knowing that he suffered and died for these people and he's going to listen to them try to tell him that their actions were good enough to get them into heaven. And how long do you think that will hold up? Not very long. Because they will have scorned the death of God's only Son in an attempt to circumvent the cross by trying to be good enough themselves. And so Paul says that those who live by faith, they say who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Who will descend up into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? And so if, if we've got this law that we can't obey, that points out to our imperfections. And we got this faith over here that says that if we just believe in what Christ did, coming to earth, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, and dying on the cross, and then rising again from the grave, and ascending into heaven to be our advocate before the Father, if we believe that, it says the word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. Every one of us, whether we've been in church or not, every one of us, whether we've grown up in Sunday school or not, every one of us, whether we've ever heard a a radio television program at all, God has written into every every human's heart his laws. Every one of us, when we do wrong, we know it. There's something within us when we do, ah, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, man, I shouldn't think these thoughts. Oh, man, I cut that guy off, and I know he cut me off, but I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have returned evil for evil. That, those pangs of guilt that we, that we experience, that's God's law written on our heart. When we stand out in our backyards tonight and we look up at the sky, There's a still small voice within us that said, this didn't happen by accident. That's God's word written on every person's heart. Whether you're an atheist or a devout Christian, the Bible says, the word is near you, it is in your mouth, it is in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. What is the word of faith that we proclaim? Two of the greatest verses in the entire Bible right here. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. See, the idea is when you Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. As the ad says, you said a mouthful. 
See, what does it mean to say Jesus is Lord? When I teach the little ones at One Way Club, I've got to give them a way to understand this. And so I use the idea that if you were to say to me, Jim, you're my Lord, please don't anybody do that. But if you were to say, Jim, you're my Lord, I could say to you, go stand in your, on your head in the corner over by the coffee pots, and you would do that. Now, if you start to argue, well, wait a minute, why would you want me to do that? It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What would it accomplish for me to stand on my head in the corner by the coffee pot? I'm not doing that. I might be something to you, but I'm not your Lord. When Paul says here in Romans that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we start with the basics. This is a football. We start with the basics. Submission. Submitting to God. Yes, Lord. Whatever you say. If you say that I can't get to heaven by anything that I do, yes, Lord. If you say that I need a scapegoat to take my place before your father so that I won't be sent to hell, yes, Lord. If you tell me that scapegoat was your one and only son, Jesus Christ, yes, Lord. If you tell me that you want me to live the rest of my life serving you so that I can stand before you someday and receive honor and glory from your son, then I say, yes, Lord. That's what it means to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It isn't an, an intellectual ascent of a historical fact. It isn't saying, yeah, I believe that Jesus lived. I believe that he died. You can even say, I believe Jesus was the Son of God. You can even go as far as to say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave. And all you've done is agree with history. You haven't made Jesus your Lord. It's only when you look at the personal side of that and say, my God, I'm the one you died for. I'm the one who, whose sin you paid for on that cross. It's only at that point that you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And there are so many of us today, there may be people even in this room who grew up being taught and believing that if you just obey all the rules, you'll get to heaven. And I'm, I, I just plead with you this morning to stop listening to the voices and start looking at God's word. It doesn't matter what I think, it only matters what God says. And God's word this morning is very clear with us. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. See, I got two choices. I can trust in me or I can trust in him. I can trust that I'm good enough to one day stand before God and he'll say, yeah, you made the cut, come on in. Or I can acknowledge that I'll never make the cut and that somebody paid the price for me. And under God's justice system, I don't have to pay for my own mistakes because Jesus paid for them. And I'm going to let him pay and settle the score. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Paul goes right back to basics again. The Jews thought just by their heritage, by their DNA, that somehow they would get to heaven. Paul says, not true. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they, and, and then, so, so we got that one down. We say, okay, I've called on the name of the Lord. I've made him my Lord. I've understood that. I've made him my Lord. What's next? And what's next comes right there. And this is where the, in God we trust, it becomes even so much more valuable. You see, because if you get yours, and then you go home and you're satisfied because I got mine. I'm saved now. I understand that Jesus is Lord and I've made him my Lord. I've let him pay for my sin. My sins are covered. You've done half the job. You'll get to heaven. But you'll stand before God naked. Your life will have mattered not. See, the purpose of your life, once you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you only have one purpose. And that purpose is to spread the good news of the gospel around the world. The crossroads was built on the principle 
of taking the word of God, the good news of the gospel, around the world, not just to Johnson Creek. You look at everything that we do, everything that we do is about the idea of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And he says, how can they, (coughs) pardon me, it says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? In other words, how can you call on God if you don't believe in God? How can you call on the Lord Jesus if you haven't submitted to him? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We've got missionaries in Ecuador this morning. Bonnie and Jim are representatives not only of Jesus Christ, but of the Crossroads Ministry, and they're in Ecuador this morning, and they're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with Ecuadorian people who have called out to God and said, God, please save us, and God has sent messengers. We've got Gary and Kathy Wetzel here this morning, two of my dear friends. And Gary and Kathy are are raising support now to go to Ghana, Africa, to minister with Brian and Debbie McIntyre to that orphanage that that cares for uh, children with special needs. But it isn't only about children with special needs. It's about reaching them and all the people around them with the good news of the gospel. We're planting a church in Columbus. And we started out with a paper pantry. Many of you saw my newsletter this last week. I'm just thrilled about what's happening at the paper pantry right now. Last month, we served 130 clients and gave away $2,600 worth of supplies. But along with that, along with those things that we gave them, we gave them the good news of the gospel. I, I spend two days a week up in Columbus working at the paper pantry, and as those people come in, I sit with them and I talk with them about their needs, and I try to bring it back to a spiritual need. And I invite them to church, and I talk to them about why we're doing what we're doing. See, the crossroads was built on the principle that we are, we are commanded by God And if he is our Lord, we don't challenge him when he tells us to go stand on our heads in a corner. We say, yes, Lord. We are commanded by God to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so Paul says here, look, they're not going to get it if they don't believe, and they can't believe if they haven't heard. And how can they hear unless someone is preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? The crossroads wants to be ascending church. We want to send people into the world. We want to equip you to share your faith. We want to equip you to not only live a good life, but to speak a good life. Because no one ever fell to their knees and confessed Jesus as Lord because of the way that I live. As good as I might try to live, that's only one half of the puzzle. I need to be able to explain to them with words, communication, what Christ did for them. And so these verses are so precious because they say, how can they preach it unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, this morning, before you leave, I want you to look at Gary and Kathy's feet. They're really beautiful. Because they're going to bring the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to an African nation that doesn't even value life. And Jim and Bonnie are down in Ecuador bringing the good news of the gospel to a poor, illiterate nation where people get up every morning and say, God, can you help me? And we're going to Columbus and we're dealing with a bunch of people in Columbus who don't have jobs, they're on disability, they're on welfare, they've been out of work, they're, they're disenfranchised, they may have been divorced, they may have had drug problems or alcohol problems and these people are crying out to God and God says, listen, I got somebody I'm sending your way. And so the crossroads wants to be ascending church. In God we trust. In God we trust not only says that it takes care of me. And God we trust says we understand the message that we're supposed to give other people is that we're supposed to take the message of the gospel into the world. And that's why our feet are beautiful. That's why the message that we, we, we speak is received. Because there's people out there And I want to say to you this morning that there are people in your life right now, there are people in your sphere of influence that are desperately looking for some hope. And don't go to the person who's got his act together. 
Jesus himself said this, a well person doesn't need a physician. People that think they've got it all wrapped tightly together usually won't receive the message of the gospel very well. They haven't reached a point of need yet. But there are people all around you who need this. And those are the ones you need to be looking for. The ones who will hear. The ones who are looking for something. There's a part of their life that doesn't fit. And we have the message of the gospel. And that's why our feet are beautiful. That's why Paul wrote those, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I just want to close there this morning. I want us to think about that. Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Have you truly made him the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered? Have you submitted? Have you done the very first thing required in order to be a successful football player in God's spiritual domain? Have you submitted to him? Have you made him the Lord of your life? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? If you haven't done that, that's a great place to start this morning. Maybe you felt that need. Maybe, as, as the Bible says, God has placed his word on your heart. And maybe you are understanding now, that's where I need to begin. And this morning would be a great time to submit and say, God, I need you. I need your saving power. I can't do it on my own. And if you do that, Ephesians 1 promises that to everyone who believes, remember we talked about what believe means? It doesn't mean historical ascent. It means making Jesus our Lord. It says, to everyone who believes, he places his Holy Spirit in them as a deposit guaranteeing your spiritual inheritance. To everyone who believes, God gives you his spirit to guarantee that you will never be condemned. That you will now be right standing before God, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. So if you're that person this morning, I beg you, I plead with you to make that decision today to make Jesus your Lord. And for those of us who've already done that, for those of us who have made Jesus our Lord, I would ask you this morning to consider your mission. Don't get caught up in this world. There's so much in this world that takes our attention away. There's so much attraction in this world that steals our time and steals our affections, steals our, our, our pleasure. Get caught up in the idea that God has a purpose for you and that purpose is a single purpose to spread his message around the world. And if you start to take that on, if you start to see everything that you do as an opportunity to share the message of the good news, it will give your life meaning and significance like you've never had before. When you start to see yourself as being a valuable player in, on God's team, you'll start to feel value and worth that you've never felt before. Not because of what you are, but because of what you do. Because you give the good news to people who are looking. To people who need it. Don't be a lazy Christian. Don't be a self-indulgent, selfish Christian who says, I got mine, let them get theirs. Follow the command of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel.